Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. everybody and welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. I'm Lisa Wolfork, your host. And as I say every week, if you've listened to more than four of these episodes, you might hear me say the same thing all the time. I am delighted and grateful to be speaking with the person I'm speaking with today. I am also, once again, delighted and grateful to be speaking with the person I'm speaking with today. I'm talking with Renee Samuels of Miss Seely's Pants on Instagram. She, Renee Samuels, has lots of years in, of experience in the sewing field as a blogger, as a pattern tester, as a writer, as a model for cashmere patterns. She has done quite a lot. And then there was something that she did recently that sparked my curiosity so quickly that I thought I absolutely have to talk to her on the podcast as soon as possible. And so welcome, Renee. Thank you so much for being here. Lisa, thank you for asking me. I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled. So I saw your photo about Notion commotion in Mm -hmm. October. And today, when this episode releases, is September 30th, the last day of September. We are heading into October. I've been talking about October as Blacktober, which was was Blacktober. (laughs) All all my months are Black because I'm Black. All my (laughs) months are Black. But I like Blacktober because it gives me a chance to talk about specific things like cosplay um, and quilt design or owning a a fabric shop, like things that, I don't know, so I call it Blacktober. So this is a perfect send-off because what we are leaning into now is what does it mean to create a sewing challenge, which is what you've done with Notions Commotion. And what we have set up for you all today is a bit of a game, a head-to-head challenge for, <laughs> between Renee and I over some of the categories that she has identified for her Notions Commotions challenge. Some of these, there's lots of different categories, but the ones that we are going to talk about, we have ahead of time, independently on our own separate notepads at our own separate homes, have written down answers to the following categories. What's the best notion for cutting? The best notion for marking? The best pressing tool? The best presser feet? And then we have a bonus of what is the best notion that defines all categorization. So I know, right? So while you, I hope you all got that. So you can think of your own answers to these questions. We're we're not going to start with our game. We're going to start with just a little bit of great background information about Renee and allowing us to tell some of her sewing story. So Renee, can you tell us how you got started with sewing? Uh, Sure. So again, just thanks for having me and letting me talk about this program uh, or about this challenge that we created. So my background, my mother did not, but my grandmother and my grandfather on my mother's side uh, are from the Caribbean, from Grenada, West Indies, Caracou specifically, which is the smallest of three islands. Mm -hmm. And they were tailors, um, except back then my grandmother was a seamstress because she was a woman and my grandfather got to be a tailor because he's a man. Um, Mm. My mom never learned how to sew. But when we, my mom joined the military and she actually retired as a colonel, but we were stationed overseas in Germany and we didn't have access to the internet back in the Um, Mm eighties. Teen magazines were always a little bit late. So these things would show up and I would see clothes that I wanted to make or have, and I didn't have access to them because you really just got what was on post at the PX and we were at a small base. And I remember one time going into the PX, which was a post exchange. It's like a big department store on a military base and being in the fabric section and looking at the simplicity catalog and flipping through it and thinking, oh my gosh, I could, I could make these things. It is possible for me to have the clothes that I want if I make them myself. So my mom sent me to a woman at church and said to her, teach Renee how to sew. 
And I took lessons from her after church and on weekends for about a year. And then, in, and I sewed a little bit, but not too much, but I knew how a machine worked. Then in mm-hmm. high school, I took home ec and we had sewing. And I swear to you, I was the only person in my class of 90 that enjoyed it. Like I wow. loved it. I was like, I will make these pajama pants. I will make these pillows. What is this stuffed animal? I'll sew that also. Y'all, you want an apron? I'll make you an apron. Like I just got really into it. How did um, this happen? So did, was it like, so <laughs> I'm trying to understand how usually, at least when I think about teaching, if you have a class of 90 and only one person in the class is excited about it, that is, that's some pretty bad teaching. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but you are not good at your job if 90 class and only one of 90 sure. is excited. That's just, I don't know. Like what did, what, that shows that you clearly had the spark. And even if you had a bad teacher, which it seems like you might have because nobody else was interested. How did you balance that? So I think what happened is I went to a small religious boarding school in Virginia. I think home ec was taught, taught in the more traditional sense of you're a woman or your kids, you need to learn how to do basics. And so it was very rudimentary, like here is a sewing machine. Here are the three things we'll make. You're done. You've now had home economics. Hmm. Um, And so I think teaching it that way versus maybe she had started the class with here's how you hem, here's how you affix a button. More practical things for a 90s kid would have worked out better than saying, you're going to make pajama pants. So yeah, there was a spark. And I really think, I know we joke when we talk about the ancestors, but I think the ancestors were in my ear. Um, Oh no, I don't, I do not joke when I talk about the ancestors. (laughs) I do not. I really do not. I've got some photos right here of my ancestors, my great, great grandmother, Virginia, who I never met, my grandmother who was born in 1913. I am grateful for them because of them. We are here. So they didn't do everything wrong. Like some people like to say. Absolutely. And so I just love sewing and I sewed through college intermittently, not a ton. I'd say, Oh, I want to make a t-shirt or there's a skirt and I could easily do it. I didn't have much of a stash, but I always had a sewing machine. Um, that my mom bought it for me from Walmart for $90 on a Black Friday special. And I used that machine probably for the first 15 years that I sewed. Wow. Uh, Yeah, I really did. It did everything I needed to do. And it's probably why I don't get, I love sewing machines, but I don't get hyped up about the newest computerized this or embroidery that because a basic sewing machine can do almost everything you need. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Then when I got my fr- second job out of college, I initially started as a TV reporter on air and you had a uniform, you wore a suit and a shirt. And so there was nothing for me to really sew at that time. Mm-hmm. But when I left that to be a gubernatorial speechwriter, I was working in the, in the state Capitol and everybody had these amazing clothes and, Oh. It was really an opportunity to showcase a little bit more of your style because it was such a forward facing role that I got back into sewing because again, there were clothes that I wanted to make that I could not personally buy, but also my body stopped being so easy to fit well in the store while still mm-hmm. slim. I had thick thighs. I had a big butt. I had a full bust and I started yes. sewing. You had all my sorts body. of, you had- you have all sorts of, I call these body blessings. Like my, yes. I call my butt, like my butt is my booty blessing. I love it. Um, and so you have some body blessings and for that, we um, give thanks. I do. Yes. I really do. And I was not somebody who was trying to hide those assets. Like I had a perky butt. I loved it. And I wanted that's people right. to see it and see it covered. Um, yes. And yes. That's, really, <laughs> that's really how I started sewing. And I think one time I, it was also the dawn of the internet. And I remember looking for a pattern online to see where I could buy it. And I stumbled on patternreview.com and my Mm -hmm. mind was honestly blown. I was like, wait, there are other people who enjoy sewing just because? Yes. Yes. I remember pattern review and I was very active in the early days of pattern review. I remember my login name. I haven't been on in years, but my login name was Lisa Quilts. I had tons and tons of stuff, tons of reviews of stuff that I made for my kids when they, now they're like seven, 16 and 21. But when they were little, 
all types of little garments, all types of stuff I made for myself, Halloween costumes, all of those stuff and photos that I had up there. It was just a, it's a great site, a really great resource. It really was. And I actually, my best friend in the world, I met through Pattern Review. It was another young woman who sewed. She lived in Virginia. I lived in Baltimore, but my parents were stationed there at the time. And so I remember setting up our first date and we've been friends now. We went on a trip to Cleveland to celebrate our friend anniversary and to go look at two different textile fashion exhibits. Like we, yeah, I like sewing really brought me a community that I didn't know existed. And sidebar related to Black Women Stitch, that friend, she was the first white woman that I met who I told her something that was a microaggression, even though I didn't have the language for it at the time. And she said to me, yeah, that was wrong. And here's why it was wrong. And I was like, wait, you see me, you understand. Yes. Yes. This is not something that I thought up until that moment, I thought, oh, just Black people understand that this happens. But no, turns out, not to use the, not to be flip, but woke, paying attention, caring white person can see it too. And you don't have to explain it to them. And I got right. that from sewing. That's, that's awesome. And, and like the way that we develop community, I think really can be the basis for genuine friendships. And I think that friendships um, survive when there are vulnerabilities um, that can be shared and sustained and not dismissed. And I think maybe one of the one of the fundamental differences between the experience that you're describing with your friend and the experiences that I had with the white sewing community that I was working with or had been with for quite a while was that they largely lacked the capacity to recognize any racism and definitely lacked the capacity to recognize their own harmful behavior. And that my thing was, I just did not want to, I just can't be teaching people all the time. My job is teaching. I'm a, I'm a professor. I love it. That's why I got into this field. But I do not want to be teaching every minute of my life. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. It was revolutionary. For me, it was revolutionary in my late 20s to meet somebody who I didn't have to do that with, but also yes. shared by hobbies. And she'll always be a dear friend for that. Yes. And I think that sewing, I wrote a little bit about this a few months ago, but sewing puts people of color into homes that normally wouldn't get to interact with you. Mm. Um, and I think that's really, I think it's something to be said for not being an ambassador or showing how you live your life, but showing that I am a person you can, and we can enjoy the same things. There aren't things that are just for black people that you can't also be a part of. Sewing mm-hmm. is this thing that can bring us together and through blogging and maybe eventually Instagram, I got to connect with people, but show a little bit of my life. And also I got to see the world through social sewing. Yes. Um, getting to follow international bloggers, people who are not native English speakers, seeing how people outside of my urban elite, buppy, yuppie (laughs) mindset. Circle, yeah, yeah. yeah, How they go on vacation, what kinds of foods they're eating, the kinds of clothes they're interested in sewing, where they draw their inspiration. Sewing really brings all of that around. I love it for that. And there's so many ways to do it differently. I was talking with Choma, who has some a YouTube page, and she's um, on Instagram, and she's Mm -hmm. based in Nigeria. And we had a conversation last year about what fabric shopping is like for her. And she's, we don't have the store where you go in and all the patterns and fabrics and stuff. We go to the market, and the market has lots of different vendors and stalls, and you buy your fabrics this way. And if you want something, you need to get it right then because there's no way that. There's no way to know if there'll be more the next day. So like, I think that, or, or that also talking with her and learning about some of the sewing scene in Nigeria was like, this is why some people really PDF patterns because yes. I've gotten really spoiled by buying, by having access, cheap access to big four patterns that I could pay two, $3 for. And if I, if I need two different sizes, I just buy two different patterns and not worry about it. But there's people all around the world who do not shop like that, for whom these patterns are never as cheap as they are for us here in the U.S. And, or are, they simply are not available. And so with PDF, it makes things a little bit easier. But at the same time, they also learn, as she was explaining, they also learn to draft patterns to fit their body. 
Yes. And that's one of the things that I think that we here in the States could completely benefit from because what we, what we're, what I see sometimes when I'm buying a pattern, I am buying a vision of my body that was created by someone else. These blocks the blocks on which many of these patterns are based are not based for women my height, my hip waist ratio that have booty blessings. None of those patterns they seem to be made, seem to be made for people who are more like chopsticks, mm-hmm. and I'm more like a bubble tea straw. <laughs> With that's bumpy, so I got a little booty bump for the bubble part, and I got some the boobs up front top. So I really I'm one of of those like nice thick bubble tea straws, not like a coffee stirrer, which is what some of the other patterns are based on. And so rather than having a complex, you just say I want to make this thing. Here are my sizes. I will put my sizes in, and now I have a garment that fits me really well. Instead of looking at a pattern and crying and feeling inadequate because you got the size, but you have to do a thousand adjustments to get it just. So that's something that I do love that you were saying about like bringing the diversity of the sewing community together and how it's so possible and also really important to do that because you can, we can learn a lot from each other. Like today, (laughs) y'all, this is going to be so much fun. We have, I have never done this before. We, before we get to that, we're going to take a quick break. Before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about D-Stash Baltimore. I wanted to give people a chance to learn about that project and what your goals behind that are before we get to our very exciting game. Yes. So two years ago, I had this idea to, I can't even say two years ago, two years ago, I pulled myself together enough to put together something called D-Stash Baltimore. And what I wanted was a big community fabric tool notion book swap. Because yes, I please. Think when, <laughs> when you start sewing or when you've been sewing, you accumulate fabric that you don't love anymore or it doesn't what? suit your lifestyle. You don't Thanks. say. Yes, I do say. Um, I don't work in a traditional office anymore. I don't need the silks, the heavy tweeds, the coat that I'm always going to have coatings, but I don't need the suit jackets. But I didn't want to just donate it or have it uh, go to Goodwill or possibly just get destroyed because no one knew what to do with it. And there were things that I would just be happy to give to somebody if I knew that they wanted it and would use it. And so I just one day was like, all right, um, you know what? I At my office, we have these conference spaces. It doesn't cost me anything. I'll just put together a graphic and see who's interested. And honestly, I thought if I get 20 people to show up, I'll be so happy. Mm-hmm. Um, I was floored and thrilled and slightly nauseous when we had 50 people within the first three days sign up. And I had to cut capacity at 75 just because I didn't know what I was going to do with everyone. And again, community came through. It was friends of mine who I met through teaching sewing or through sewing, friends of mine who don't sew and barely understand how to thread a sewing machine, (laughs) volunteered to help. And we had about 75 people, mostly women, show up. We had, I don't remember exactly now, but we had over a thousand pieces of fabric, um, a couple hundred books, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patterns. And we came and we spent about an hour and we de-stashed and swapped. And I walked away with coatings, with wool jersey, um, just prints of fabric that I loved. And I think everybody felt good because it, it wasn't necessarily about consumerism because we weren't repurchasing. I also felt that it wasn't just being thrown out and we all got to communicate and talk and hang out. It was a really great time. And I learned a lot of lessons from it and I plan to do it every other year. Unfortunately, the day that I picked this year was the day that the world basically turned upside down. (laughs) Yeah. Going into D stash Baltimore weekend was the weekend that Maryland, uh, went into lockdown. So I had to cancel it. I had it on hold for a little bit thinking I could maybe somehow pull it off. I even thought about ways to try to do it outside so that people could grieve. And we had about a hundred people signed up this year too. But but my husband and I went to an outdoor wedding that we thought would be a little bit safer than it was. And it was not. And I thought, I don't want to be in this position of policing other people's behavior. Right. And I also don't want to be in a position of if something goes wrong, I would feel responsible. Yes. So yes. And I would be responsible. So I just yes. decided to put it off this year and I'm hoping summer 2021 is when we can make it happen. 
Yes, I would love that. And I'm definitely going to keep my eyes peeled because I will absolutely drive up to Baltimore to to say that I am donating lots of fabric <laughs> to do stash, which to I say, will, which I will. Do with anything, though. I did not say anything about that. <laughs> that is not the topic of the conversation, Renee. The, com- the topic of the conversation is Lisa is going to go to do stash Baltimore and she's going to carry fabric from Charlottesville, Virginia <laughs> to Baltimore, Maryland for the purposes of do stashing. Now, what she returns with is anybody's guess. Who's to say? Probably nothing. <laughs> For you, we all thought we were walking away with nothing. And you won't be alone. We had folks coming in from New York, from Philadelphia. We had one woman who since moved to Minneapolis, but she said she would come back the next time we pulled it together. It's a great time. And I would love to see something like this happen in other cities. And anybody yeah. listening, if you want it to happen in your city, I have a, a document that I can email you with tips and tricks and Honestly, if Southwest flies there, I'll show up and help if you need it. That's a great idea. So for those listeners, and we, I know we have listeners, I'm very fortunate to say we have listeners on um, six continents and in 95 different countries. So if you are in a community and you would like to meet more people who are sewing, if you would like to get rid of some sewing stuff that you know is precious, but you're not sure if you take it to the local um, jumble shop or there's, there's really no place to de-stash fabric sometimes because you never know like it'll, if it'll get picked up or not, you can create a nice little micro event that allows you to do this. And I'm sure there's a way that they can, we can maybe hopefully scale it for COVID or just wait until, like you said, next year when things open up. But I imagine it could be really fun to have uh, a D-Stash Atlanta, a D-Stash, a D-Stash Charlottesville even, where I would absolutely not take any fabric because <laughs> if it was here, I can't, it, it needs to be somewhere else. It needs to be, maybe I'll talk to my my friends, Sierra and Sansare Burrell and ask them if they want to help with um, D-Stash Richmond. Yeah, I love Sierra. Isn't she great? And her sister's amazing too. Her sister did the logo for Black Women for the um, Stitch Please podcast. Oh yeah, she's, she's an artist. A designer, I remember this. She's an yeah. artist and a designer. They're, they're both wonderful people. And yeah, maybe they can run, I will help run D Stash Richmond because it's not anywhere near my actual house. I cannot, <laughs> I cannot, I'm telling you what, if somebody came up with a thousand pieces of fabric all spread out and said, I'm, and I've, I've already identified a location in Charlottesville for this event, but I am not, I'm, I'm not mentioning it because I don't want it to happen here. It needs to happen in I Richmond. I will come. I will have, yes. I love Charlottesville. I'll be don't, there. Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> listen, listen, Linda. I, listen. listen, Linda, listen. <laughs> I have enough fabric in this studio for a good little while. I cannot, um, in good conscience, participate in a D-stash and knowing myself, <laughs> saying, okay, I'll be like, you know how sometimes if like little kids or even sometimes adults, if they don't want to hear something, they put their hands over both ears and go, la, 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 la. That's what I would have to do for the D-Stash Charlottesville because I would be walking in there saying, here is my my wheelbarrow full of fabric. I am leaving and not coming back for four days. Lisa, um, I am not joking. There were people who pulled up in minivans and said, just take it. I am not walking inside. I don't need to see this and pulled out. It was amazing, but terrifying. It's like, like it you, was... had, you had contact-free pickup before it was necessary to have contact-free pickup. <laughs> Very much, yes. Very much. Oh, my gosh. All right. Um, We're going to take a quick break, folks. And when we come back, we're going to explain our game. So stay tuned. Hey, Stitchers, we are getting ready to celebrate Blacktober. Um, Just like last year, we had a lot of really exciting new folks to talk with in different areas of the sewing community and the sewing industry, and this year is no exception. As we get ready to head into Blacktober, I wanted to emphasize three Black women-owned businesses who are having exciting events themselves this coming October. So stay tuned and check the show notes for links and more information. Are you looking for representation in your fabric? Listen, I got you. 
Here at Quinoa Renee Fabrics, we provide custom printed textiles that focus, center, and reflect on black culture and community. Like right now, we're holding a pre-order for our holiday fabric. Our holiday fabric features a Kwanzaa print, a black Santa and family print, as well as some naughty Mr. and Mrs. Claus prints that you just have to see. For us, gone are the days of looking for characters and designs that you can truly see yourself in. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or online at quinoireneefabrics.com. Come see our fabric that is sure to start a conversation. Did you know that you too can make a bra? That's exactly how other women felt when hearing about Bra Making Mondays, a four-week bra making workshop where you learn about sizing, fit, and how to make a custom bra, a program designed for confident beginners, intermediate, and advanced sewists. The next session of Bra Making Mondays begins October 5th, 7 p.m., a safe community full of body positivity, a nurturing and supportive space to make the most gratifying garment you've ever sewn. Register for Bra Making Mondays at SewingMyStyle.com. Interested in learning how to dye fibers with acid dyes but not sure where to get started? Colorful Findings offers classes for beginners to intermediate students on how to use acid dyes for their sewing projects. Designed specifically for bra makers, Colorful Findings offers step-by-step projects to learn how to create your own custom dye colors. Mention Stitch Please when you register and receive a bonus custom recipe to use during the class. Sign up at ColorfulFindingsClasses.com. Welcome back, everybody. You are listening to the Stitch Please podcast, and I am joined today by Renee Samuels of Miss Seely's Pants on Instagram. She's going to share with us this really fantastic idea she has that starts tomorrow. So you are on the very cusp of the beginning of this idea, and it's called Notion Commotion. So can you tell us about it, Renee? What made you think of the idea and the categories and stuff? Yeah. So I, if you have followed me for any period of time that I like a tool, I like a gadget, I like a notion. I find that tools and notions are as important as the machine that you're sewing on. They make, they give you a professional finish. They make the job easier and they're very specific for what they do. I'm not the kind of person who looks for the easy way around. I look for the best way to do it. And tools and notions are often the way that you can use them for this. And I thought, oh gosh, I love a sewing challenge, but I myself, I'm not really into everyday posting and taking pictures of myself. I'm not a neat person. I'm very messy. So my sewing room is not nice to look at. My mirrors often have dust on them. And I thought this is a, this is a sewing photo challenge that is fun to pull out your tools if you like your notions and tools, but also is a great way to show other people what's available out there. Um, using a notion and tool is very much the behind the curtains part of sewing. It's not often that you see somebody there with their pressing ham or their butterfly scissors and understand that they're using this to achieve a result. And so Mm -hmm. by being able to once or twice a week, post this, have this prompt and be able to show people what you're using, but also the timing is well timed for the Hanukkah Christmas season. Yes. It's a great time for Kwanzaa, build that list out, see what That's people right. are suggesting and figure out what it is you might need. So if we do that in October, you are all set for November shopping. That's absolutely true. And we'll probably do the Stitch Please podcast last year. We did a holiday gift guide where we um, went through some tools. Um, I talked with a charter member of Black Women Stitch, and she and I, this was Alicia Holland, she and I discussed our favorite notions and some of the things we loved and why we loved them. And we had a list up. And I think what we could do this time is we are going to talk about our favorite notions And what I think we, well, I'm going to do for mine and maybe what you could do for yours too, Renee, is if you would share the links for Mm -hmm. your products, I will put the links for my choices in the show notes so people can see exactly what we're talking about too, if they are interested in getting it for themselves. Okay. Since you are my honored guest and you have created this challenge, talk about some of the categories and then we'll talk about the categories that we are going to be discussing. So what are some of the categories that you have for the challenge overall? 
It's twice a week posting every Thursday and Monday in the month of October. And the very first category is going to be machines. And that is outside of your regular sewing machines. We're going to leave it open. What's the machine you're interested in? Is it, do you use a serger? Is it a cover stitch? Is it a bias tape maker? Yes, it is. Is (laughs) Is it a hemming machine? There are all kinds of machines that are outside your basic sewing machine that um, is confusing to people. I know when I've taught sewing classes, I've tried to explain there's a serger, there's a cover stitch, there's a blind hammer. And so this is a way to talk about machines outside of regular sewing that you might want to add or don't understand necessarily how they work. Right. Uh, so that will start us off. And then next category is rip it. And it's all kinds of different ways of how do you open up a seam? How do you rip it open? I've learned from sewing over the years that everybody has their favorite tool or gadget for Mm -hmm. a seam. It is not always a seam ripper, which will come up, I think, on our quiz that we're giving each other. Yes, it's true. (laughs) I know someone, she's actually in the the D.C. um, area, and she uses a straight razor. And whenever I see her with this razor, and she's excellent at it and she's fast. And every every time I see her, um, I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope she doesn't lose a finger. (laughs) But she would, she will not. If I tried to do it that way, yes. uh, And this, uh, yes. If I tried to do it this way, I would lose a finger. I have seen surgical scalpels. So that would be mm-hmm. perfect for you if you did hurt your finger. Um, yes. I've seen things that look like the must or like a, like a facial hair trimmer. Must have trimmers. Yes. 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 It's like Those, a little peanut. Yes. Exactly. It was really um, expensive. Like they called it an electric stitch remover and it's 80 or $90. Yeah. And then, but you could also get like a little mustache trimmer that's maybe 20 bucks, but it, $20, but doesn't work as well as the actual thread trimmer. I don't know. So I was, I have been thinking about that, but they do, they do buzz a lot. They're pretty loud. There's so many tools. They, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I shouldn't say that, but there's more than one way to tackle a problem. There is and more than I one think, way to tackle a problem. <laughs> and by notions can help you do that. Um, we're going to talk about tracing, like whether it's the kind of tracing you wheel you use. Is there a tracing paper that you like? Show us what is the thing that you use when it comes to tracing or marking. Um, pressing. This we could do a whole month on pressing tools, notions, yes. and gadgets. The world is wide yes. open. Is it your ham? Is it your seam roll? Is it the shoe that goes over your iron? Is it the your same, iron? The seam stick, your seam stick, yes. is it the short seam stick, the long <laughs> seam stick. Is it the seam stick with the padded cover or just doing a regular rolled wood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a whole oh. episode on pressing, just on pressing versus ironing or a press cloth. Yes. Because yes. sometimes it doesn't matter if you have all that stuff. If you totally mess up your garment because you didn't put a press cloth down, it's shiny. there is no fixing it. So, And even along those lines, one time my husband saw me come downstairs and grab a paper bag and go upstairs. He's like, what are you doing with that? I'm like, oh, I need this to put under my seam so that the seam doesn't press through. There's... It's, mm-hmm. it's things like that. Mm-hmm. I know for myself, when I teach, I haven't been able to cover all of the tips and tricks. And I think you don't always see them when you're looking on sewing social media to understand no. how people arrived at that. We're going to talk about buttonholes. You got excited earlier when I brought up buttonholes. You did. I did. At buttonholes, there's so much that can go go right with a buttonhole. And I think for me, the reasons that I have touch wood, I'm touching wood now, have had such great success on my buttonholes is that I have a great machine that does buttonholes really well. And I have a whole arsenal of tools <laughs> that help me make my buttonholes great. And because you were talking about the things, the things that you like with buttonholes. And I was like, yeah, but none of that matters if you don't do blank first. So yeah. <laughs> And that could be, like you were saying, it could be the buttonhole gauge, the spacer, the ruler you use. Is it the fray check? Is it the way you, what tool do you use to cut open the buttonhole? Exactly. We're talk about scissors. I mean, yep. scissors alone. I mean, oh. I will fight you over my favorite pair of scissors. Oh, I bet. Oh yeah. I know it. I know it. I know it. I have kids and husband and like, I have told them if the scissors are in this basket, they are for you. <laughs> if the scissors are, if the scissors are on a wall, if they are on a wall, on a hook, if they are laying on top of a piece of fabric, they are not for you. And I've also taken to writing the word paper on any, <laughs> like on the blades or the handle of any scissors that they could also use. So I had to do that as a newly married woman. I came downstairs and saw my husband um, wrapping a Hanukkah gift 
and he was using my fabric scissors. And when I tell you, my heart was in my throat and I thought, am I going to commit a murder this soon into my marriage? I know. Like, I am not like, they said marriage was hard, but I did not expect it to be this hard. What am he I going to do? I should just say he has since learned. He oh, well, has I'm his sure. own scissors. They are labeled Jordan. He knows if they don't say Jordan, he is not to use them. My husband has his own iron. <laughs> oh, seriously? Yes, he has his own iron. I did not require this, but I use a gravity feed iron. And mm-hmm. he was like, I don't want this iron with this snake iron attached to the tank at the top with the thing. I just want to iron my pants. I'm going to use this black and decker that I got from, from Kmart before it closed. And this will be my iron. And I'm like, okay, sweetie, that's yours. That joke, like you don't want somebody giving you a vacuum cleaner as a wedding gift. If somebody gave me like a gravity feed iron as a wedding or birthday present, I might kiss them like those. Oh yeah. It's an amazing tool. Again, it's just another tool and it's, it's awesome. It really um, is. I think something that the last day I think will be the most fun day because it's unconventional and it is, tell us about something you use in your sewing practice that's not necessarily marketed towards sewing. Yes, I love that. (laughs) I think that's going to bring a lot of great ones out of the woodwork. So this sounds like a really exciting challenge. I am very excited and I'm excited uh, from just to review, we settled on four, one, two, three, four. We settled on four categories that we, that Renee and I are going to play right now. And then we also have a fifth one, which is a bonus category that we're just going to identify as the notion that defies all categories. Okay. All right. Oh, I just want to also acknowledge, I'm going to put this out there in the show notes. We had an episode a few, we talked about about me being excited about the bun holes. I'm excited because I did an episode last month, I believe, called Buy All the Machines. Mm -hmm. And this was from the tipsy pincushion who bought a buttonhole machine. I want one. I have thought about buying one and putting it in my basement garage and then I would charge people to make their buttonholes, but See? I would have regular access. I've thought. See, listen I've to that. About if, this if, so you, hard. if you have not listened to that episode, listening to that episode about her process of researching, ordering, assembling, and making will push you over the edge because <laughs> it is, it's one of my more, it's, one, it's, it's a bit, it's been a very popular episode and it's, and she talks about it in really great detail. So I recommend that one if you haven't heard it. I think it might be episode 42, 43, but I'll put a link to it in the show notes so people can go back and listen to that one. But a machine that does nothing but buttonholes and it cuts them. Yes, the, the laser cuts them. There is an African-American gentleman here in town who is a tailor. He does a lot of work for the Washington Opera. Mm -hmm. Um, He has, his entire basement is decked out like a costume studio and he does buttonholes and he didn't even charge me. Like I called him up. He's like, yeah, I'll do them. I brought them over. He went through them like this. It was amazing. I had a friend drive up from DC to have cut button. He even has, I'm getting so excited. I'm tripping over my words. He has the corded buttonhole maker too. And he <gasps> did them for her cashmere coat. Oh and my it took gosh. no time. And it was so beautiful. The so cord beautiful. in it? With yeah. a cord? Oh my yeah. gosh. Whew. Oh getting my a, gosh. Getting a little warm just, just thinking about Just them. beautiful. <laughs> I can't wait till you get yours. Um, watch, this is going to be my business. I'm going to have it set up. You just pull up to the back. I'll make the buttonholes and you're on your way. Yep. I'm, I'm excited. So that when I come to D-Stash Baltimore next year, I'm going to bring some stuff um, that I don't want to do buttonholes on so you could do them with your new machine. Excellent. I'm also claiming first spot because you, because I just did. Dibs. I just announced it here. So yeah, you heard it here first. You heard it here first, folks. Okay. All right. So we're ready. So the first category we decided was going to be cutting. So as you are, again, a steam guest and you created the challenge, what notion are you identifying as the most important, best, powerful, favorite cutting notion that you have? So for me, I would say it's my bird in hand notion. Now, a bird in hand is actually a clamp that you use mm-hmm. to hold a garment so that it gives you a third hand. Mm-hmm. And the reason I love it is particularly for ripping seams or cutting my seams. I can clamp it to use the third, the bird in hand clamp, attach it, use my left hand to hold the garment. And then my right hand, I'm able to just cut through and slice so quickly, so smoothly, instead of like straining my fingers and using Mm -hmm. my two hands to try to hold something open. Mm -hmm. To me, it is revolutionized the way that I deal with my seams cutting and ripping. 
Excellent. Bird in hand. Okay. I like that. Bird in hand. For me, I'm going to identify for my favorite cutting tool will be pattern weights. I love pattern weights. I do not like to pin. I stopped. (laughs) No, really. I think I've been sewing maybe what, 25 years, 20. And I stopped pinning maybe 17 years ago. As soon as I figured out how I could not how I could avoid using those like horrible torture devices. I I figured it out. I didn't, I do not enjoy pinning patterns, but I do enjoy cutting with scissors and rotary cutters. So for me, sewing, sewing pattern weights. um, And I'm going to give a plug for thanks. I made them. She's amazing. And she makes these delightful pattern weights. And she made some for the Stitch Please podcast. And if you buy these, y'all, if you buy these by the end of the month, which is by the, today's your last day to buy those, 20% of the proceeds are coming to us. But even if she didn't make these for us, I, I own four sets of her pattern weights <laughs> that I have purchased. Um, and I've purchased them for other people. And I, the reason I like them is the versatility. I like being able to lay them down for cutting lingerie, laying for cutting coats, for cutting outerwear, for cutting bras, panties, anything you need, you can you don't have to pin. You can you don't. Lay, you don't have to pin and the pattern weights help with that. So I really like hers. They are these little tiny like 2-inch squares. They're heavy and um, they come in a really nice little case. I have my cases of them in my toolbox that I use for my when I know I'm going to be cutting a garment, I take out this particular toolbox and all the resources and marking tools and pens and chalks and all that are in there. And it just makes me excited because when I see my, when I put my pattern weights out, it's helping to get my mind set for sewing. Okay, cool beans. All right. So we've got bird in hand versus pattern weights. Excellent. Okay. So the next, I wonder, how do we decide who, maybe we should put a survey up later. Maybe we should put a survey, but what if we have a tool that is unfamiliar to people? I'll do a video. Okay. I could do that. Just to add, I was going to say for pattern weights, I like even that, I can think of four different kinds of pattern weights I have in mm-hmm. my sewing room. I've got the professional long, heavy iron cast yes. ones that I got in the Garment District of New York. I've got these awesome ones that I wish Ulfa would bring back. They're yellow and they're two it's, different sizes. Mm-hmm. And they've got those little spikes at the bottom. At the bottom. So they, and it's like, it's, like a, it's like a hard donut, yes, right? And they, would, and they nest. <laughs> Yes, Lisa. Yep. I saw those on somebody's blog and I did not talk about them publicly until I had secured them from (laughs) eBay (laughs) because they were discontinued. I'm like that. I am absolutely like that. Once I have it, then you all can know about it. That's right. Um, But if I don't have it yet, (laughs) (laughs) I would love to see those come back. June Taylor made these really cute pattern weights that are in the shape of sewing garments our sewing tools. And then there's another kind, I'm not sure who makes them, but they're curved and L-shaped. And so they fit in different parts of the pattern. Yes. And they also have some that are filled with beads. Have you seen that? Or sand? Yeah. yeah, Like the little... mm -hmm. I think they're called wiggle weights. Does that sound familiar? Like you can use them to go along the curves or whatever. That was one of the advantages of those that kind of had the sand in them. Yes. And then there was you and I are kindred here. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, (laughs) I told you, told you. Okay. So so that's what we're deciding on. Now we're going to switch to marking. What did you have as your must have go to marking tool? So I put the Chaco liner as my must have go to marking tool. The Chaco liner, it's a plastic tube, and at the bottom it has a wheel that disperses a loose chalk. Yes. The reason that I like it is I'm able to get right against the ruler edge of what I'm marking. I have found that if I use the wider, sort of more widely acceptable waxy chalk, mm-hmm. it's already on its own about an eighth of an inch thick. So you're not marking the exact place that you want to be sewing or need to know. But with the Chaco liner, I can be extremely precise. I've had one that's lasted me for probably five, six years now. Hmm. Um, And I particularly like the one from Clover. So I just think the Chaco liner for me has been my marking tool of every day. Cool. I respect it. I'm with it. I respect it. What you got? What you got? I am choosing the Frixion Colors marker. The Frixion Colors marker is different than the Frixion ball tip. 
methods, and it's different than the Frixion fine lighter or highlighter. This Frixion has a felt tip, and it's like a felt tip marker. It's very juicy. I really like it because while it's easy to mark on a bunch of like cotton and linen fabrics, I sew with a lot of ITY knits. And that can be very difficult to have visible markings for your darts and your pleats and all those things that those garments also have. Sometimes it requires a lot of markings or where you're going to put your pocket, et cetera. And so I like the Frixion because it shows up better than any of the other marking things that I might, like I use wax, I use wax free, I use chalk, Mm -hmm. I use all types of stuff. But Frixion has become my go-to and I'm very careful with it. I always test it before I use it. It's sometimes in the, 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 one of the things that's so great about the Frixion is that it disappears with friction and it also disappears with heat. So you can iron it away. Sometimes though, even on white fabrics, you can get a, an echo or a shadow Mm -hmm. And so that's why I always test and I always, if I know it's going to be a problem, I'll put it just in the seam allowance. But I freaking love these markers and I have about 50, 11 million of them. <laughs> and, I, and, and that is not, 50. no, so seriously, 50, 11 million, like <laughs> seriously, like Beyonce up in the club with 50, 11 girls. I'm mm-hmm. up in this sewing room with 50, 11 friction markers. I've got the stamps. I've got the ballpoint. I've got the retractable. <laughs> I've got the highlighter. I've got the fine lighter and I've got these and like, I'm, I'm boosting all this. Fr- you would think that Frixion was sponsoring me. Frixion does not know me from a can of paint. <laughs> and this is why I can give unvarnished reviews of stuff that I like. I know some people think that Marks come back when it's cold or in the freezer. I was I, going to ask about that. I have not had that experience. And I even did an experiment. I did, did a test piece, put it down, ironed it, and then put it in the refrigerator for three days. And the marks did not return. Now, the refrigerator is different than the freezer. But I'm also thinking, like, where are you going to be marking your garment that you will be outside in below freezing temperatures? Yeah for it to, ret- you know what I'm saying? So for me, the reappearance with cold is not, it's not an issue unless maybe you had a coat and you had marked all of your outside stitching or whatever. And, but I'm like, for me, I can't think of a situation where I would necessarily do that, but I always encourage everybody to test it first. And if you want to be safe, just put it in the seam allowance where no one's going to see it if it returns. But that has not been my experience. Ghosting, that has been putting it down, ironing it, and looking back and seeing a trace of the mark on some fabrics, that's the only downside that I have personally experienced with this. But I love the Frixion stuff. Hooray! Look at us. Okay, so we've got our Choco Liner versus Frixion. Nice. And then the next category is... Pressing tools, pressing tools. This is a tough one because there's like a, oh, a no. lot of pre- pre- who. What are you gonna? I don't, I, don't, I don't even know what you could what what to say. I did I did pick something, but there's a lot of options. So, what is your favorite presser pressing tool? So I picked something too. That is, I won't call it my favorite pressing tool, but I will say it is a convenient and handy one that a lot of people don't know about. And that is a ham holder, specifically mm. a vintage ham holder. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't even think I bought it because it was a ham holder. I, I think I bought it pressing a contour pressing ham that they threw in the ham holder. <gasps> and it's they I threw know in the ham they, holder. What they the threw what? It in. Isn't that crazy? And it's probably about eight inches in diameter. And it allows you to put your ham in all kinds of different. You can have a fat side up, skinny side up. Yes. Um, If you turn it on, it's it's for the curve. It will hold it in place so it doesn't move. And it's one of those things that until I had, I didn't realize how convenient and wonderful it is. Dritz has since, I believe Dritz now makes a smaller version of it. Is it blue And and made out of plastic? Mine is brown no, no. and made out of plastic. I think the new one is blue or black. Okay. And it's, it's maybe four-ish inches in diameter. Okay. Um, I think it is so convenient and wonderful. And until you have one, you don't know what you're missing. And I think if you can't find a vintage one, 
I believe people for a bit were using, oh, I'm going to show my ignorance with sports. The thing you put a football in to kick from. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that's called either. <laughs> so that thing. let's call it the football spike thing. Yes, that, yeah. that is also an option. Now, now, what do you have? Okay, so I'm going to totally concede that you have won this round. Because the thing that I chose is wonderful, but I have been wanting a ham holder for years and I still don't have one. (laughs) So what I chose that I love, I still think it's great. And that's my Clover Hot Ruler. And the thing that's so great. familiar. Okay. So the thing that's great about the Clover Hot Ruler is that it has markings on it. It's It's a piece of some type of fused polyester felt of some sort that is highly heat resistant. And what you can do is that in certain patterns, it'll say turn over half an inch and press, Mm -hmm. turn over five eighths allowance and press. The texture of this tool, which is two and a half inches by um, 10 inches long, you lay it down, you fold your fabric over it, and then you press it. And it helps to the fibers in this, in the, the, the hot ruler. I think I'm, I think I'm calling it that. I'm not sure if that's the exact name. Anyway, the fibers in it help the fabric to cling to the ruler and then accept the heat that will come from the iron, giving you a really firm, lovely press. Lisa. Yes. So you're spending my money today. Is that what's happening here? I am. Hey, I look. I have had a ham holder in my Amazon cart for quite some time. And I think (laughs) the one that I found was made by someone. And so you are making me think after I'm done with this call, I need to just go ahead and hit add to cart on that thing. Because when you go to press something and you don't have to use both hands, like you can uh -uh. just, yes, you already know. I do. I do know. I do know. Because one of the things about a ham that's so great, unlike a, um, what that sometimes they call it, the sausage the seam roll Mm -hmm. is that the ham has two distinct ends. So the top end is narrow for narrow shoulders and for bust darts. And then the bottom end is bigger. So if you have a bigger bust or if you have a curved neckline, you're meant to use all four cardinal directions as it were of a ham. You're meant to use the small end and the big end at the bottom and both sides. And, And that's why they have different textures of fabric on them. So the ham holder really does give you a chance to do that, especially important if you're like ironing, like or not ironing, pressing like I am with a gravity feed iron. Those things are heavy, yes. four pounds. They're heavy. So I have yeah. one hand holding a four pound hot weight that could burn my hand. And then my other hand is balancing this ham with the garment on it, making sure that I'm pressing the curves of this collar proper. So yeah, I need a ham, I need a ham holder. This is an idea whose time I, has come. I just realized, um, and cut this if it doesn't work, but there is a, I wrote year, maybe 10 years ago, a blog post on the different versions of hams that you can, or were able to purchase in the United States. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is great about, again, the international sewing community, I didn't know what a press buck, press buck was until I was looking at one on somebody in the Netherlands was showing one. And my dad said, oh yeah, that's a press buck. My father grew from who's Jamaican versus my mom, who's Grenadian. He grew up ironing his clothes and using a press buck, which looks like a small footstool almost, but that's what he would use to correctly press shape into his garment. And for hams, in the United States, we really had two different sizes. There was a dressmaker's ham that I think we can conventionally use today for things like darts and smaller collars. But then they also made a larger, um, actually three different ones. They made a larger version called a tailor's ham that was supposed to help you with things like princess seams, things that were a little bit longer and needed more of a curve. Yes. And then I have one of those. I, I love it. And then I think what we don't see manufactured anymore, mass, mass, mass produced anymore is a kidney-shaped contour ham. Yes, yes. I think I might have seen one of those at Wawak. Did I, am I making that up? Oh, did you? I could, look, don't listen to me, as my mother likes to say. Don't start me to lying. <laughs> I thought I saw one there. I could be wrong. And I think that one is just great. I honestly mostly use it for when I'm pressing the seam in seam in a pants, that curve, and it it changed my pressing life. I didn't list it as my favorite, but it is... If you can find one, folks, grab one. 
Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we're doing really good. We've got our three categories done. We've got two done. We've done our cutting and our marking and our pressing. Now we're going to get to presser feet. What is your number one favorite presser foot? I have one written down, but now I think I might need to change it. But I won't. I'm going to be, I'm going to be legit. I'm going to, I identified this earlier, so I'm not going to (laughs) change. I think you're doing what I'm doing because I thought I had uh, decided, but I also am changing my mind. But I'll, I'll, I'll also stick with what I first had. I think for garment sewers, we undervalue the use and abilities of a quarter inch presser foot. Mm-hmm, I yes. think we think of them as piecing feet that quilters use. But I have found that this foot is wonderful for top stitching. Yes. Um, it is inside to be a boring person. But if you're sewing something where the seam is completely encased, a quarter inch seam on a collar or on a lapel is much easier to deal with. And if you have a quarter inch presser foot, you can have that precision. Yes. And I just, I think it's an undervalued tool for fashion garment sewers. I, I agree with that. And it was so funny because that was what I was thinking about changing mine too. So that's perfect. Yes. <laughs> um, because one of the things I love about the quarter inch foot is that I sew a lot of bras. And mm-hmm. so for bras and um, and on panties, the seam allowance tends to be a quarter inch. And also you recall, if you've sewn quick sew patterns, their seam allowance I thought was almost always, at least it used before, unless maybe, they, I don't know how it is now, but it used to be that they had narrow seam allowances, that they had a quarter inch seam allowance. And if and you do your own patterns, like if you buy like a Berta or something where you add your mm-hmm. own seam allowances, what I would do was I would um, just trace the pattern normally and then go around the edge and sew it in a, with a quarter inch seam allowance. Yes. So that I would have it, the pattern would, I, that's how, that's how I added seam allowances to my pieces by sewing a basting stitch around the ones I had traced. Oh, that's so smart. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, and as, <laughs> instead of using the ruler, I just did the sewing and it helped me to orient myself better to the pieces themselves. So each component could make sense. And I, I was adding the seam allowance and I knew it was going to be the right one because I'm using this exact foot in this exact distance. But yeah, the quarter inch seam allowance is a great foot. The one that I put down was the top stitch foot. And the the top stitch foot, or maybe it's called the edge stitch foot, whatever has that little blade in it. The edge stitch foot, or sometimes it's the overcast foot, but it's used the same way. But the thing for me was being able to drive that foot Mm -hmm. like you're driving through, like you're driving the prow of a ship through calm water. Because for me, I just marvel at, they would have these two seams and I'd press them and whatever. And then I would take the foot and just make sure the blade was in that seam. And when I was done, you couldn't see any of the stitching that I had done. It was all actually embedded in there. It was in there, in that seam. And I just love it. it it's it's like still a per- game changer. It was. And it's just, and, and it came with the machine. And I was like, see, I need to practice with these feet some more. Um, because that was a, re- it's a really great foot. So maybe that is the edge stitch foot. I'm not sure. But whatever one has the blade that, it's not a cutting blade. So don't think that I'm cutting my fabric as I'm going. It's not like that. It's just this really thick guide and your needle is seated behind it. And so as you're sewing, it's sewing exactly along um, the path that you're you're, you're intending it to. And I don't know why I can't get the same effects with an open toe foot. It's not the same. I just can't get the same effect. But Lisa, I need you to know that that's what I was going to change my (gasps) answer to. Look at great minds, y'all. We just we and, and like how look, look at all this serendipity. We just met. We just had our first phone conversation a few hours ago, and we have all this sewing stuff in common. Okay, so this is going to be the big one. This okay. is so this last round is a bonus category, and this is the notion that defies all categories, and this is the notion that you think is so great and so amazing that. Regardless of all the categories, whether it's for cutting and measuring and everything, this is the one that you think everybody should have. This is the one that's been the essential game changer. What is yours? So I'm going to go with a seam guide. A seam guide Mm. is the tool that you either use a magnet or a screw to attach to your sewing machine so that you can see a clear path of where your seam allowance should be. Mm -hmm. Um, The reason I picked a seam allowance guide is when I would teach sewing, 
I think the question I had over and over and over again is how do I keep my street seam straight? How do I keep a consistent seam allowance? And if you have a good seam guide, even for me, I've been sewing 25, 30 years. It is, it is your, it's your candle in the wind. Like you can keep your, well, it's probably not the best candle in the wind. It is your North star. There you it go. Your North I was like, star. that candle in the wind is going to blow all over the place, girl. Out. Don't tell them it's a candle. Please, no, that was the wrong one. Bad one, bad one. Um, but it's your North star. You can use it as your guiding light. And it'll keep it precise and nice and straight seams. And I think it is an underused tool. And my favorite one, I'll send a link to my favorite version, but it's actually curved in parts and concave and convex in other parts that you Uh can twist it around so that if you're sewing something curved, it's got a curved angle. If you're sewing something straight, it's got a straight angle. I love it. So that is my, if you want your sewing to be better, consider a good seam guide. Yes, I love that. I love that. I mean, and because I do use seam guides as well, I purchased one. I'm a big fan of Nancy's Notions products through Co- Clover. So I bought that one. But honestly, I feel a bit like my mother because she is a mother of invention. And I instead have stopped using that one. And now I use a kind of a do it yourself hack version of that, which is a half inch. What was that? Half inch? No, about a three eighth inch stack of masking tape. Yes, that I yes, cut yes, yes. that I cut into two inch strips. So I'll get like a one inch wide thing of masking tape or painter's tape, and then I'll say this tape is not to be used for painting or whatever. This is to be used for these steam guides, and I'll just buy it and score it with a utility knife and peel it. And then as I work through it, I can peel off the bottom and stick it down. And whenever the sticky gets old, because it's like a three ace or um, half inch stack, just peeling off one thin layer at the bottom refreshes the whole shebang. And it'll, and it helps me because my baby lock machine comes with what didn't come with. I think I'm sure I bought it. It has through my purchasing a gorgeous, wonderful dual feed foot, but this thing is the size of a softball. It is huge. I mean, it has like a laser and it has all this other stuff in it. And so it's hard for me to see what the markings are on the sole plate because the foot covers them Mm -hmm. a bit. So for me, putting down that tape and when I'm doing curves or, and I do, it's a great way to hem circle skirts. When you mm-hmm. use that roll, when you use that foot, it helps you to, but the tape is the thing I'm saying. I got this like very expensive sewing machine that I keep in great order with masking tape. Let me share mine. So here's mine. I know this is probably not going to be a surprise to people who have listened to the podcast or people who, especially folks who are my friends who know me. I am going to identify as the notion that defies all category, the fast turn tube turn set. That is not just a game changer. It is a life changer. And everybody out there who is turning tubes with a safety pin and a prayer, Mm -mm. a chopstick and a dream, (laughs) or um, (laughs) one of those things that looks like a very lean, fine metal thing with a with a circle about the size of a quarter at the end yes and that little hook god bless america and god bless you because all those are i know for me i'm telling you this fast turn tube turn set i have had the dripped one with no oh no ma'am no ma'am it is not that this one is made by a company called crowning touch And it comes with the set itself. Again, I bought this maybe 25 years ago, at least, at least 25 years ago. And I had the set first and then someone gave me uh, the case that it came in. But the Fast Turn set is made by Crowning Touch. It comes with, one, two, three, four. It comes with six brass tubes in various widths and lengths. And it comes with three little copper, like they're very narrow wire channels that you can use to thread up 
so basically, I'm going to try to describe it. What I'm, gonna, what I'm actually going to do one day is I'm going to do a demonstration of this on my Patreon channel for people to see like how amazing this is because it's really game changing. So imagine you have a tube of any width. So say you say for, how about this? You take a two inch piece of a two inch strip of fabric. That's 44 inches wide. You've done, you've gone, you've just, you've just done a rotary cut across Mm -hmm. the width of fabric. You've run it through your serger because you want to get it done quick. Uh, You've pressed it. um, So it could be, so that seam can be a bit flat. You then take that 44 inch wide or long strip you slide it over the chamber of the fast turn and you shove it all the way down. The the, the tubes are very strong, so they can hold a lot of fabric. So you like pushing it down, pushing, 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 pushing. Then you take your little tiny, I call it a little like a pigtail tool, which is like a long, thin, strong wire. You thread it up through the open base of that chamber Then you find the seam allowance at the top of your tube. You put, you hook that little, that little pigtail tool goes right through the seam allowance and you pull. And as you pull it down through the brass tube, the entire thing comes along with it. And I'm telling you, it will change your life, your sewing life about making bag handles, belt loops, spaghetti straps doll's arms because fabric jewelry i've made a three chain necklace from scraps of a dress using this method by taking these fabric tubes sewing them on the serger real quick laying down the tube and putting a piece of thick chenille yarn next to it and so when i'm pulling it's also pulling the yarn it's pulling it's turning and stuffing the tube at the same time that's incredible. So that it's, just... just, it's weighted. This junk, this is, it's like Megan the Stallion of <laughs> sewing notions, the fast turn tube set. I've heard that they, I've heard that they're a bit scarce to find these days, though I did have some friends that purchased them on eBay, like a vintage one on eBay for not very much money. I think when I bought this, I might've paid $60 for it. But again, that was 23 years ago, 25 years ago. And I would pay, if someone was going to take it from me, I would pay it again to keep it. It is really that good. It has got nothing compares to it. Nothing is like it. Not the drit set or the set with the blue. It comes with a blue tube and a white tube and a stick. No, ma'am, you deserve good things in life. I know we just met, but I want you, I want you to have good things in life. We'll see how fast I am on eBay and Etsy after this, after our chat. This, I'm telling you, this thing is worth its weight in platinum. And I know that, and you might think of it as a one tube, um, a one use implement, but something else that one of my um, friends uh, during the holiday gift guide episode explained that if you need to couch, oh, this is good for two things. One, if you need to couch elastic through a drawstring, and sometimes if you don't have a bodkin or you're not able to Mm -hmm. find yours or whatever, you can run this tube, depending on how um, it's shaped, you can run this tube through the casing and use the little the little thing to pull your elastic through it. So it makes it really yes. easy. It makes it really I did that for a pair of Vogue pants that had um that had double elastic in the back. And um I was working on it and I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is taking forever." I said, "Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Hold up." I got that tube set out and I had that elastic threaded in there in less than 4 minutes. Mm-hmm. It worked so well that I went on I unthreaded it and went on and did an IGTV video showing people how fast it was. It was that fast. And another thing that it's good for is if you are making masks that where you have where you need to thread your elastic through the side piece or the side seam that goes near the face, mm-hmm. it's very easy for that. You just put instead of trying to push the elastic through after you've closed the seam, you can just take the tube, stick it in there and drop the elastic through, move the tube, and your elastic is in. I will tell you the reason that mostly sounds amazing to me is I must have four different things for threading elastic. And this sounds like the best of them, and I don't even own it. I just started last year when we did the episode. It was Alicia Holland mentioning that's what she used it for. I've had this tool for, like I said, 23, 25 years, and never thought to use it for elastic until she mentioned it. 
And when you think about, say you have a garment where you have a neckline that's ruched or whatever, and you need to thread um, a string through it to gather it or whatever, if you leave part of it open so that it's flat, you can thread much of the garment on there and you can draw it through that way. So depending on how tight the curve is, it can be really helpful for garments that way. So that's mine. That is mine. I like your seam gauge, though, because crooked seams um, are nobody's <laughs> friend. <laughs> All right. This has been so amazing. Is there anything else you want us to think about as we move forward to starting your challenge tomorrow? Anything we sure. need to be aware of? I know um, that there'll be more details um, coming out in advance, but I just thought today was such a fun day being the last day of September to be able to talk about notions and just a way to document some of the things that we really love about sewing. So I would just say, I think within sewing, we can get caught up on the size of somebody's stash, the cost of somebody's sewing machine, or thinking, I can't do this because I don't have that. Or if I spent $3,000 on this machine, it's going to make my clothes or what I'm making all that much better. And so this isn't a challenge to make anybody feel that way. I think it's actually the opposite, that there are things that cost five, ten dollars or mm -hmm. maybe even free in your home right. that can help you level up. And if you want to level up, then this is if not participate, definitely follow along and see what you're missing out on. I think that's an excellent line on which to conclude. Thank you so much for joining me today. Can you tell us where we can find you on the socials? I just love giving everybody a chance to let people know where they can find you. Yes, I have a blog that I've maintained for about 12 years now at MissSealy'sPants.com. And I'm on Instagram as at MissSealy'sPants. I also am an editor at The Socialist, so follow along there. It's a sewing blog for everybody, and I will be doing a lot of work there in the upcoming year. That's fantastic. Hey, this has been a delight. Thank you very much for the conversation today, and I wish you great success with the Notions commotion, and I look forward to playing along some more because this was really fun. This was a lot of fun, Lisa. Thank you so much. I feel I've met my match and I can't wait to come up with this again. Yes, indeed. You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out with, to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transcripts, and other things to strengthen the podcast. And finally, if financial support is not something you can do right now, you can really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them. So I know that not all podcasts directories or services allow for reviews but for those who do for those that have like a star rating or just ask for a few comments if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the stitch please podcast that is incredibly helpful thank you so much come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together